Welcome to the NoosaCast YouTube channel. These Red Smith Banquet throwbacks are exclusive interviews of sports legends, powerful media personalities, and influential coaches. You won't find these anywhere else. Subscribe below and enjoy. All right, Tosh, it is time for a Red Smith Banquet throwback. We go to 2021, crazy year, COVID, and we had to go to a virtual show. But somehow, Tosh, that led us to our today's throwback, which is Joe Torrey. Yeah, Joe Torrey. I mean, when you talk about a baseball guy, it's Joe Torrey. All right. Just incredible manager, uh, player, um, assistant, you know, to the commissioner. I mean, he's pretty much done everything you can imagine as far as baseball is concerned, right? Yeah, he definitely has. He was also a radio announcer, a TV, uh, you know, color analyst. So I, I, you know, I can remember he, he has a fantastic voice. Uh, so I can remember, oh, you, you can remember Joe Torrey through a lot of years. Bob Euchre is, is tight with him and his brother. So you've always heard Joe Torrey stories. So you, you might ask, well, how, how the heck do you get Joe Torrey in a COVID year? Jeremy Davis, who does the interview, um, does a fantastic job. His dad, Jerry Davis, was a big league umpire for a lot of years. And and Joe Torrey was a director of umpires for a while. So they developed a relationship. And we were able to to pull it off on online and, and, and got Joe Torrey set up. His, his, his lamp was, was good. The lighting was, was good. We were set. And you're, you're going to see it. So him and Jeremy have a really cool dynamic. The throwback to Joe Torrey at the Red Smith Banquet in 2021 was part of our podcast featuring Mike Dreheim. A link to the episode is in the description and also posted on our YouTube channel. Please hit like and subscribe. It's huge for us. And then check out our catalog because, you know, Tash, what do we have 40 some of these on there? And there's been some incredible people that, that are on there. So just check them out. There's really, really cool stories. I, I, I literally I've, I've been at every one of these banquets. Um, but every time I hear the throwback, it's been so many years since I've heard them, I'm blown away. And sometimes I just laugh out loud and I'm a letter carrier. So sometimes that gets a little embarrassing. So <laughs> check that stuff out, hit like, and subscribe and enjoy Joe Torrey. It was the 1971 national league, most valuable player. Um, as a manager, he's fifth all time on the career wins list and won four world series with the New York Yankees. Um, in 2014, he was enshrined in the national baseball hall of fame and currently serves as special assistant to the commissioner of Major League Baseball. Um, he is the legendary Joe Torrey. Joe, thanks for joining us for the 56th annual Red Smith Sports Awards. Well, Jeremy, it's, it's nice being with you. You know, anytime you can, you know, start talking about baseball, you know that uh, the warm weather is not too far away. Absolutely. Well, for, in Wisconsin, it's a little bit further than everybody else, but um, we'll, we'll get there eventually. Um, I know. I, I experienced that early in my career. I, I you know, that was pretty good, pretty good way to break in, you know, Milwaukee, when I remember going there for, um, you know, some public relations functions in January, and I was in the motel, and it was cold, I had the heater all the way turned up, and I remember calling the desk the next morning, I said, uh, you know, what? what's the temperature out there? And they said, it's 11. I said, well, that's not, not as bad as I thought. They said, <laughs> below zero. I said, oh, my goodness, it's a little chilly. Well, outside of the cold, what's one thing that you really remember from your time in Wisconsin? Well, it, Wisconsin was, was great. I know, uh, you know, I always look for great places to eat. In Milwaukee, they weren't shy about having uh, – you know, a variety for you. But the thing that made it so special for me, Jeremy, is the fact that my brother Frank played in Milwaukee when, uh, you know, the Braves were in two World Series in 57, 58, and, and they were able to beat the Yankees in 57 and fell short in 58. But, you know, it, it always felt like uh, someplace familiar uh, because of just the warmness of the you know, the fans, and it, it, it was a cool place to play. And, of course, uh, unfortunately, during that time when I was playing for the, the Braves there, you know, we did uh, move on, picked up uh, our stuff and moved to Atlanta. But uh, the Milwaukee franchise was always pretty special to me. 
I mentioned a few roles that you've had in Major League Baseball. Obviously, you, you've played a number of them um, between player, manager, now, now a front office job. Which, which role do you think that you've played the best? Which one did you excel at the most? Well, I, you know, I guess uh, I had the most success overall uh, as a player. Uh, I was pretty consistent throughout my 16, 17 years as a player. Uh, with a batting average close, lifetime batting average close to 300 and, um, and, you know, bounced around for a few different teams. I started with the Braves, as you know, and uh, was traded to the Cardinals and then from the Cardinals went to the Mets. And that was, you know, th that was my playing career. Ended it, ended my playing career in New York in uh, 77 and started my managing career in 77 in New York with the Mets. But, uh, you know, probably the most satisfying for me uh, was my managing career. I mean, I, as I mentioned, I started with the Mets, moved to the Braves, had some success with Atlanta for three years. And, and then, you know, I was uh, out of, off out of uniform and uh, broadcast for the Angels in, uh, you know, in Southern California for six years, close to six years, worked for Gene Autry out there. Uh, which, you know, was a nice perspective uh, to, to see it from up in the booth. And I can guarantee you the game it looks a whole lot easier from up there than it did down on the, on the field. Absolutely. So I, I went from there to managing the St. Louis Cardinals. So I, I you know, three teams I played for, uh, I managed. And, of course, uh, I got fired from all those three teams. So. <laughs> Going to the Yankees uh, in 1996 was an opportunity for me to, you know, I know worked for George Steinbrenner, uh, who was very tough, and there was no question about it, but uh, you knew he was going to do whatever he can to put players on the field for you. And so I guess I got a long way around to getting to the point where, you know, managing in my early uh, earlier years, I, well, I was a hundred games under 500, and then go to the Yankees and uh, had the success I had was probably the most satisfied uh, I've ever been professionally in the game because uh, you know you you had players that that won and were successful, and they just never stopped. Uh, they they just uh, never got tired of winning, and it was a special group I had. You, uh, your current role is special assistant to the commissioner of Major League Baseball, but before that, uh, one, I know one of your responsibilities was overseeing the umpires, which is where this connection originally came about. Uh, my dad, Jerry Davis, is a 38-year Major League Baseball umpire, as you know, and, and our Red Smith audience will remember him uh, for winning the Red Smith Award uh, last year. Um, your careers overlapped quite a bit, so I'm sure you've probably got a few stories, but he loves to tell one about you guys from the 1996 uh, World <laughs> Series. Could you share that story? Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I missed my first World Series. I was excited. And I, I don't remember, Jeremy, exactly why I was going out to argue with him. I think there was a balk or, or something that was called. And I went out to explain to him that, you know, th this guy, you know, is a National League pitcher and and, you know, he's done this before and, and whatever. And he looked at me and he said, Joe, he says, I know that. I had him before. I'm a National League umpire. And with that, I just shrunk to about two feet tall. And, but it was fun. It was fun. Your dad's <laughs> always had, he's always had a good disposition. You know, he, you know, sure, he's ejected people and, and he's had to do what he's had to do. But he pretty much has let, pretty much lets the players play and lets the managers argue. But that, it's sort of, here I am in the middle of the field with the whole world watching, you know, and I feel like a darn fool because <laughs> of what he said to me. But he, you know, he kept that between us, well, obviously, until he shared it with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have been the first time that he was ever wrong. So, so you're, you're, not in, uh, you're not in bad company oh, there. Um, Trust and he, me, I found that out. <laughs> and and he, he did throw you out, not that particular one, but he did throw you out of a few games, cor Correct. Oh, yeah. Yeah. As I said, but he, he always, you know, he gave you plenty of rope. 
You, uh, you mentioned uh, starting your career in Wisconsin, really even before Milwaukee. You played some minor league baseball in Eau Claire, correct? But, I did. I did. Yes, I did. Class C ball. Nobody even heard about that anymore, you know, because A is the lowest we have. The, the Braves, when you first started playing for them, were obviously led by the late Hank Aaron. Um, can you talk about what he meant to you as a teammate, as a friend, and then ultimately what he meant to baseball and, and even really our, our whole country? Well, you know, Jeremy, I, I sort of cheated a little bit. My, my brother Frank, as I mentioned, was playing for the Braves. I was a teenager, and I, you know, I flew to Milwaukee. I was my first uh, plane ride back in 1956, and um, and you know, so I got a chance to meet the uh, the Braves that uh, I didn't know it at the time that I would wind up being teammates with. Uh, you know, four or five years later. And so, uh, you know, when I did get to know Hank, you know, as a teammate, uh, it, it was it was a lot more comfortable for me than than it, it could have been. But he, uh, you know, he was a solid citizen. And when I say that, you know, he he was a superstar, and, and he didn't act like it, which I always, you know, thought was cool. Uh, you know, and Eddie Matthews was one of my favorites also, and he was the same type of guy. Uh, and both those guys used to jab at each other in that clubhouse. And, you know, it never got serious. It was always in a kidding manner. But uh, Henry was, you know, let's talk about baseball first. He, he was some kind of player. Uh, and he wasn't colorful like uh, Willie Mays. You know, they, they paralleled their careers. Willie was ex more exciting to watch because, you know, his hat would fly off as he'd run around the bases and, you know, he'd get the ball in the outfield and airmail it to the catcher or to the third baseman or wherever he's throwing to. And Henry did everything by the book. Hank, Hank would, you know, feel the ball and throw and hit the cutoff, man, which is as managers, we always tell our outfielders to do that. And uh, he was a great, a great right fielder and, as far as being a hitter, uh, you know, that that's where I think he left Willie. I, I thought he was a better hitter than Willie Mays. Uh, but Willie at the time was probably more of a power hitter. And then Henry, as you know, he went through his career and and all of a sudden the home runs started coming in, uh, in, in bushel baskets. And he uh, wound up breaking uh, Babe Ruth's record. But uh, just as a player, he came every day very generous with his time. Um, there was one in incident when I was already traded to the Cardinals because I, I was traded to the Cardinals in uh, 1969. And I remember uh, being on an all-star team with Hank, and, and, and I was having trouble hitting one pitcher uh, you know, uh, it was Bill Stoneman who was with the uh, Montreal Expos at the time. And I said, Hank, can you help me here? I said, because I, I, I just can't pick up Bill Stoneman. He throws that curveball and I, I, I lose, I, I lose sight of it. That, you know, do you have anything that would help? He says, just go up there and hit off the slider. Now, what he means by that is try to find that speed in between the curveball and the fastball, which would be the slider, and just, you know, just look up up there and look for a slider all the time. And all of a sudden, that curveball didn't disappear anymore. So, you know, Hank was a great student of the game. As I mentioned, he was very unselfish, helped anybody who needed it, and uh, was a great team player. I mean, he played every day. Uh, stole bases, but didn't steal them for numbers. He just stole them to try to win a ball game here and there. And he was, uh, you know, uh, he's going to be missed because he was a special friend and, you know, always enjoyed visiting with him at the Hall of Fame. And, you know, from time to time, he would come to New York and, and you know, we'd get together. What was it like leading the, the Evil Empire, the team that everybody loved to hate? I remember my first meeting with all the team and I and I had also remembered you know in whatever sport it may be basketball football you know when a team wins a championship there are a lot of those teams that spend all their time celebrating and then the next year or the next season for them they never show up 
you know, all of a sudden they're not as good as they were and they didn't compete. So one of the things I said to our team, I said, guys, I said, I never been to a World Series uh, other than, you know, buying a ticket. And uh, I said, I don't want to win just one World Series. I want to win three in a row. And it, it, it was just something. And the reason I did that is because I wanted to let them know that, you know, once you do win, if you're lucky enough to win, you, you've got to validate what you did or who you are. And, you know, this I'll be darned if this club, you know, doesn't go out there and, you know, win four out of the first five years uh, in the World Series. So it was it was a special group I had worked for George Steinbrenner, which wasn't easy. Uh, and we get to postseason in 96. Uh, and, you know, we're playing the Braves. They had won the World Series in, in, 90, in 95 uh, and. We uh, we went out there that first first night uh, in New York, at Yankee Stadium, and we got our our rear ends beat up that first game against the Braves. They killed us double figures, and uh, and then the next day, I'm sitting in my office before the game, and George Steinbrenner walks in, and he says, uh, "This is an important game, or this is the most important game." And I said, "You know, I felt like saying, no kidding." I said, "You only got seven to play. You're lucky if you play seven. So I said, "But I was just in a very relaxed mood for some strange reason. You know, I spent my whole career wanting to get to the World Series, and here I was. Uh, so no, I was bulletproof right now. I, I just felt that I had accomplished my goal, even though once you put the uniform on, you certainly want to win." And I said to George, I said, we're facing Maddox tonight. You know, we, we may, and we're, we're out of sync. We hadn't played in eight days leading up to the World Series. And I said, uh, George, we may lose tonight. He, I said, now I start kidding him, but he doesn't know it. I said, I, I said but, uh, you know, we're going to go to Atlanta. That's my town. We'll win three there and come back and win it for you Saturday night. And I walked out of the office. And that's exactly what happened. You know, we did get beat that night. And then we went down to Atlanta and uh, won three tough games. Uh, uh, David Cohn won uh, game three for us. And then, uh, you know, we had a great comeback in game four where we were down 6 nothing and, and wind up winning uh, in extra innings. And then uh, Andy Pettit, after getting beat up in game one, pitched the gym, one nothing. We won uh, game five. And then uh, Jimmy Key, you know, was the clincher for us in uh, in Game Six back at the stadium. So it, it was it, it changed my life as far as you know career wise. Um, you know, we went out there and won the World Series, and then of course the next year lost in the playoffs. But um, it, it twelve years in New York, it wasn't easy. Uh, but it was uh, it was really special to do something like that with that organization, especially in your hometown. You uh, you've obviously recalled some incredible games and moments that you've been a part of in your career. But one of, one that I really wanted to ask about didn't have anything to do with the game, um, the 2001 World Series, right after 9/11. Of course, you and the Yankees were playing in the series, and President Bush was at Yankee Stadium and threw out the first pitch. I mean, I get chills down my spine watching that video on YouTube. What was it like being there in person? I think we all realized that the world would never be the same at that point in time. But when George Bush and, well, Derek Jeter got a hold of him before I did. And he warmed up with him because the, the one thing about President Bush, he wanted to throw a strike. He wanted to throw a strike. And, uh, you know, he had the bulletproof vest on, so it really wasn't the most comfortable way to go about it. Well, Derek went, took him to the batting cage where he could warm up. And, you know, he was getting loose. And, of course, need, needless to say, Derek used the old needle again. He comes out and he says, just understand, you better. You have to throw it from the mound. Don't get in front of the mound because the fans will boo you. And don't throw it into the dirt. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and with that, he left President Bush. So when uh, 
uh, was welcoming before he went out to throw out the first pitch. He comes, he comes down the runway, President Bush, and he says to me, you're going to kick their ass tonight. I said, we're going to try. And, you know, with that, he jumped out of the dugout, gave the big wave, and then, you know, went out to the mound. And I'll be darned if he doesn't throw a strike with the one, with the one toss he had. But that was, uh, that, that was something. That, that was quite a feeling. And, you know, Roger Clemens went out and pitched the gem for us where we got on the winning side of the ledger for uh, game three. We've touched a little bit on a number of different roles that you've played player manager, player manager together, um, now in a front office job as the special assistant to the commissioner. What, uh, what's your career goal now? What's, what's next for you? I don't know. That, that's a good point. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm probably, you know, I wanted to phase out a little bit with uh, major league baseball because it, uh, you know, you can tell your dad this, you know, the umpires were a full-time job and I didn't want to be full-time anymore. <laughs> so, <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I want to stay connected in some way, Jeremy, because, you know, I, I'd like to be able to offer my opinion. Uh, the game, the, the game, I, I, I'm a little concerned because, you know, the last couple of years you've had, you know, home runs, strikeouts and walks. And to me, I, I think we need more entertainment on the field than that. You know, the stolen base, the, the triple, the first, the third on a base hit. But uh, there are too many swings and misses. And, you know, that's going to take some changing in philosophy, yeah, you know, for different teams to, to adjust to or readjust to, I should say. But uh, analytics, and I, and I believe that you use all the information you can get, but sometimes you got to understand and, and never forget. Actually, you should never forget that you're, you're in the game, you're sitting in that dugout as a manager, and you have instincts that I, I don't want you to ignore uh, just because the numbers and the, the numbers that were crunched out tell you something different. I, I think you've got to still use your gut every once in a while. Well, I sure hope that uh, Major League Baseball is listening to that opinion, and we, we certainly share or appreciate you sharing that opinion and so many, uh, so many memories with us as well. Um, thanks for joining us, Joe. Enjoyed it, Jeremy. Thanks very much. Please subscribe to this channel, give this video a thumbs up, and hit that notification bell so you get notified when we post another great episode or interview. Download the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you for your support.